Welcome to the Cedarport Come Follow Me Made Easier podcast. I'm your host, Linda Cherry, and today my co-host is Sam Castor, the author of the book, Zion Rising. We are going to be discussing a big chunk in the book of Samuel today about Saul, the Philistines, and King David. Hi, Sam. Welcome. Thanks for joining me today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. The story begins with a most interesting account of the fact that the Israelites, who were losing constantly in their battles against the Philistines, had this great bright idea that they were going to take the Ark of the Covenant and they were going to send that out in battle with them against the Philistines. Do you remember what happened, Sam? Yeah, it's terrible. It doesn't work. <laughs> it, it leads to their destruction. And it's so sad, too, because... Well, I know you're going to get into it, but it's so sad because they're missing the whole point. I know we're going to talk about that today. Yeah, so they lost the battle. And in fact, the Philistines captured the Ark. And as was the cultural way of doing things in that day, the Philistines, to show that their God was stronger than the Israelites' God, put the Ark in the temple of their God, Dagon, who is a fish god. And interestingly enough, while the Ark did not help the Israelites in their battle, The ark, nevertheless, God showed his power through his ark in the temple of Dagon when when Dagon's statue fell down twice. Mm -hmm. And the second time, his head and his hands broke off, which is rather symbolic of the fact that he had no power. And so the Philistines became very nervous, very afraid, and thought maybe this God of Israel does have more power than we thought. But nevertheless, they still keep the ark for a while and they're The Philistines are plagued. It's just miserable. And they realize it's all because of this Ark of the Israelites. And they decide that they're going to send it back. And because they're afraid to touch it, they're afraid to have anything to do with it. It's interesting that they send it back on a cart with oxen, with no one leading those oxen, with the sense that those the oxen are just going to take the Ark back where it belongs. In fact, it actually does end up going back to the Israelites. And then there's another sad story associated with it. Do you want to share that one? They, they end up trying to put it back into the temple and have this restoration experience, but it, it doesn't work out for them as well. But before we jump to that next point, if it's okay, I, it, it's fascinating to me to see how the Israelites make this mistake and God still uses it to try and even bring the Philistines to closer to him, yeah. to point to the truth. Yeah. So when the ark goes back, it's not quite to the temple site yet. They look in it and they're struck dead. And then there's this just overall sense of superstition about the ark itself. So that the scriptures tell us that the ark is not even touched for 20 more years. Like everyone is afraid of it. So first of all, the Israelites were clearly placing their trust in a thing and in a sacred thing. And when we think about what the ark was meant to represent in the first place, It represents the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. And it was the sense that someone came before God and that the ark was called the mercy seat as his throne. And they are to enter into his presence worthily and with respect, reverence, and awe. And instead, they're looking at the ark itself in a superstitious way, like the ark itself is what has the power. And they are clearly trying to rest or use God's power through the ark without any knowledge or authority in terms of conquering the Philistines. And so everything inside out and backwards for them, we're told that during this time, they're quite apostate. They are worshiping other idols and involved in all kinds of breaking of their covenants. And instead of looking at their own hearts and looking to repent, uh, they're looking at this artifact as having all this power that they're going to control and they're going to command to do what they uh, want to have happen. What are your thoughts? I, I don't know how many of those watching have or listening have um, have ever watched um, Indiana Jones and the Lost Ark. <laughs> yeah, but it's very similar in archetype, right? This idea that the Nazis are going to have control of the Ark and try and will it for power and it ends up uh, leading to their destruction. And the, the, one of the fun takeaways I remember having as a kid from that movie is that you can't control God, it, it, that God is mysterious and powerful and, and those kinds of things. Those are the impressions that I had as a kid. But when you read it in the context of uh, this story that actually happened, it, it's, it's profound to me that the Israelites are missing who the ark is meant to lead them to. It isn't that the ark itself is brings salvation or brings 
this this power, but it's that God is meant to be there on the mercy seat, that Christ is meant to be, this is a place where they're able to connect with him. Does the ark have power in and of itself? Absolutely. It has this effect because it's been influenced by God and because of God's power that he put in it, just like other objects that he's done things with. But to focus on that is to miss the whole point. But to focus on that is to, to miss the fact that he's really trying to invite them to him. Just like when he, when he first gives the ark back to Moses and instructs Moses and also Joshua, the whole point of the ark is that he can come reside with them. He can reconnect with them. He can be, be with them. And it's fascinating. Imagine, I, I, I have, I, I often thought about this, Linda, imagine being in, to the extent we can with our finite brains, imagine being in God's position where he has all this power and he, and his, his mere presence changes everything. Right. It elevates everything. It's, it probably is a difficult task to help people who aren't worthy to be in his presence, to get to a place where they will be worthy. <laughs> Without destroying them. <laughs> and to make it more challenging for the Israelites is that, again, they had all of these neighbors worshiping other gods that were represented by idols. Yes. And the Israelites were made fun of at the time because they had an invisible God. Yeah. And so for them, this thought that they're using his artifact as a sign that he is with them, just as they had remembered, I'm sure, circling Jericho with the ark. And Jericho fell down without even a battle. And that they'd used the ark. The ark had gone before them in the Red Sea and the ark had gone before them in the Jordan River. So that still, they're still having a hard time themselves really understanding who God is. And they wanted a symbol um, to represent him. Do you think people get caught up into that challenge today? Do you think that they're, that we have a challenge? Because uh, I remember this beautiful, sweet story about a little girl telling her dad that she wanted to have someone comfort her who had skin on. In other words, her dad had told her that the Lord was with her and that they could pray. And she says, I just want someone with skin on to, to be with me because we have a hard time um, seeing the sense that God is a very real presence with us uh, when we specifically look at how others are manifesting God by their symbols or artifacts or such. But what happened here is that the children of Israel became stuck on the symbol and lost God behind it. Do you think we're in danger of that today? Is there anything today that you think we get um, stuck on and put our power in and our trust in and instead of God? Absolutely. I think it's, it's human nature to try and identify something around us, a physical object or whether, whether it be the, the simplicity of Babylon or the, of the hedonistic tendency inside of us to be like, oh, if I have a car, a really fancy car, I'm important, right? That's on the non-religious side where we worship these idols, of these things of power, these things that uh, we think will influence those around us and, make, uh, and elevate us. But for those who are trying to be worthy followers or those who are trying to come closer to Christ and, and be disciples of him, I think there are times where it's natural for us to put power in an object and instead of in him. And I think the Lord works with it. I think he understands that we're feeble and we're learning how to walk. And so that one day we can run so that one day we can fly and be connected with him. But there is this risk that if we think that an object or something physical, it will save us. We're missing the whole point because as Alma tells us in the Book of Mormon, all of these things around us are meant to point us to Christ. All of these things are meant to be invitations to come to Christ and know him and be with him and reconnect with him because he is our God. He is our salvation. He defines us, not these trappings or belongings or objects. And <clears throat> there are lots of, there are lots of religions and, and, and including our own that have symbols or, or icons or from the, I, I went to Catholic University of America. The cross is a very uh, sacred and, and holy symbol for the Catholics and it's beautiful and powerful. And I think God respects that. And. I think that if we're not careful, it ends up eclipsing our view of who we're really meant to be connected with. It's Jesus Christ and, and God, our father. So great insight. And something you shared with me in an earlier conversation is that there are certain objects that God clearly does protect and, and his power is surrounding. And we could talk about how many temples have been preserved during natural disasters and so forth, where. This is God's house and they are preserved. 
Interestingly enough, though, again, we have to always be looking for that balance because later, much later, as we uh, progress in the Old Testament, we'll read that the people of Jeremiah's day, when the temple was actually destroyed and Jerusalem was destroyed, uh, because of things that had happened earlier with the temple, specifically during Hezekiah's reign, that the people had come to look at the temple also in quite a superstitious way. And they said, as long as the temple's here, Jerusalem cannot be destroyed. And that's even after the Babylonians had come against them three times. And so they genuinely believed that the temple itself was going to save them. But like these early Israelites with the, the people of Jeremiah's day were not repentant. They were not aligning their will to the will of the Lord. And so, in fact, they were very stunned and, and horrified when the Babylonians did come in on that final conquest and destroyed the temple. The same thing happened after Jesus's ministry. The people had this idea that the temple could not be destroyed. And so uh, when Christ prophesied that it would be, uh, they were up in arms. It was one of the accusations they pressed against him. Yeah. And in fact, that temple was destroyed in 70 AD. So I wonder, Sam, if we put these stories together, if part of the reason the temples have been preserved in our time during the natural disasters, or we've had miraculous stories about the temple in our times, that it might have something to do as well with the people, those Latter-day Saints who are living near them and, and the state of their hearts and their faith. Absolutely. And, and there's a material distinction between, we were talking about this earlier, it isn't that the, an object precedes a miracle. It's faith in Christ precedes miracles. And the ability to have faith amplified or assisted with an object is something that, that Christ does, but it has to trap, it has to tap back into the true source of power. So when Christ comes and heals uh, the blind man's eyes and he, he spits in the clay and puts the clay on the man's eyes, or a very similar story when Enoch has his eyes uh, washed, or when we get baptized in water, or when we do these other things to try and uh, show our faith, God uses those instruments. We use oil to do uh, blessings for the healing and the sick. It's right in the Old and New Testament, this idea of using an object as, a, as an assister or a, as, a, as an instrument of faith is something that he works with us on it. He facilitates his miracles through it. But the true power is the, the heart of an individual having faith in Christ. It's the faith that heals. And there's another good example of this, and I think it's important to distinguish the difference between faith. And I know we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but between faith and priesthood or power and, and authority, it's into, I, I have been you know, corrected at times as, as someone who holds the priesthood and, and I've given blessings accidentally saved by the power of the priesthood. And someone, I, one time someone corrected me and I'm like, no, you need to say by the authority of the priesthood. And it's interesting because the power, if you understand the difference between faith and miracles tied to faith and saving ordinances tied to the priesthood, the power of faith is what makes a miracle. The authority of the priesthood is what brings salvation. And understanding both of these elements and understanding that God uses them to help us become who we're meant to become, to help us work these in his name. It's an important understanding of those two. It is. That's a beautiful analogy. I thank you for sharing that. Because when we think about the Israelites sending the ark out with the Philistines, that is completely, the ark is, is supposed to be carried only by mm -hmm. specific priesthood holders with authority. So okay. whether, whether or not they were part of that battle, we don't know, but we do know that it wasn't God's will. So if those priesthood uh, leaders were carrying the ark, and again, we don't know, it would have been against God's will. So this sense of faith, trust, authority, and not resting God's uh, power or speaking in vain of God's power or speaking, speaking words that would not be his are really underscored in all of the stories we're going to talk about today. And in fact, for the next chapters, it blends in beautifully to the points you just made because Samuel calls after this incident, the prophet Samuel calls on the people to repent. And it's important to remember that Samuel was the first prophet in literally hundreds of years that had come to Israel. And they had some pretty poor habits in terms of how they were living, even how the temple was being treated. Because just before Samuel, we have Eli and his sons. And Eli's sons were perverting the uh, sacrifices in the temple and, and sleeping with women by the tabernacle and so forth. So we have Samuel, who Hannah had dedicated to the Lord. And 
he's bringing new hope to Israel and trying to teach Israel. And so he, after this incident, he calls on all the people to repent and to fast and pray. And an interesting thing happens because, and he told them they had to put away their gods. I think it's worth mentioning just for a few minutes what gods were being uh, worshipped by the Israelites at this time. They had Balaam, and Balaam, by the way, Baal means husband, which I think is a very poignant title because Jehovah calls himself the husband of Israel. Mm -hmm. And Jehovah says he's married to Israel. And so we have the Baalim, which would have been multiple gods that were worshipped in the male form. And then we had Ashtoreth, who is the female form. Now, I think it's really important for us to understand when people today are asking many questions about Mother in Heaven and why we don't know more about Mother in Heaven is that anciently, and we, and we mean for thousands of years, Israelites worshipped Ashtoreth and even brought a tree representing Ashtoreth or into the temple itself. And the what they understood about Ashtoreth is that she was called the Queen of Heaven. And sometimes they even called her God's wife or Yahweh's wife. So when she was brought into the temple, they referred to her as they were going to worship the male Jehovah, and they were going to met, uh, worship his wife. Ashtoreth was, was worshipped under trees or groves, and we'll read about that. Mm -hmm. Now, for some reason, for some strange reason, every time the female deity was brought in, there also came in what was called sacred prostitution or fertility rites. So in every case, there was there were priests or priestesses that were assigned to literally have sexual relationships with the people who were supposedly worshiping. And there was all of this sort of contamination of the cult, which is why uh, the Lord called this kind of worship adultery mm -hmm. and accused the Israelites of adultery when they worshiped this way. And we see it for thousands of years. And even today, the archaeologists are unearthing just numberless thousands of these statues of the fertility goddesses. And archaeologists are claiming Israelites never believed in one God. So it's interesting when we have a little bit of context for that. None of us know why we don't know more about Mother in Heaven. But the truth is that whenever anyone in the past brought in a Queen of Heaven or a God's wife, things became perverted really fast. Yeah. And, and so in any case, Samuel calls on the Israelites to repent, fast and pray, get rid of their idols. And they do. And guess what? The next time the Philistines came against him to battle, God gives, a, as it says in the scripture, a great thunder. Mm -hmm. And the Philistines were defeated and the Israelites were able to take back some of the land that they have lost. So compare these two stories and the sense of who they're putting their trust in and what you were just sharing about miracles come after. And the correct source of power, right? It, I love that it's thunder because if you've ever uh, heard a thunderclap from a, a bolt of lightning, or if you've ever seen the brilliance of uh, when you have a spark, when you're actually plugging a plug in and you can see that electric, that electrical current, the true power plug in, and that power comes from that relationship with Christ. That power comes from faith in him. So much so that one of the other beautiful examples I have of this that demonstrates that you don't need priesthood to create miracles as important and powerful as priesthood is. Priesthood is for salvation, but faith is faith. In Christ is what precedes miracles. And a beautiful example of this is the woman that comes to Christ and says, heal my child. And he says, I'm not supposed to minister to you yet. And she says, but even the, even, you know, he, and he also says, I don't give the, the bread to dogs. Now people might read that and go, wow, that's really offensive. But what's fascinating is that she then says, but even the dogs get the crumbs. And then Christ says, because of your speech or because of what you said, this demonstration of your faith by what you said, your daughter is now healed. This is a woman that didn't have claim on the priesthood. She didn't have claim on being of the house of Israel. She wasn't supposed to be within his ministry yet, but because of her faith, her daughter in Christ, and because of her willingness to speak and, and claim that, that power through him and, and having that faith on him, her daughter was healed. This idea of true power, like a thunderclap, I think it's so critical that we understand how valuable that is. And then it's so critical that we understand that coupled with that is this idea of authority, that God is saying, I have a structure, I have a vehicle, I have an order to avoid the defilement and the ruin and the destruction that comes with you going off after strange gods or you not recognizing 
that there, there is a way for me to help you come back to be with me through the priesthood. I love that. It reminds me of that scripture that says, stand still and know that I am God. Oh, yeah. Or even the great battle when Joshua first came in, the sun stood still, hmm. is that God, when the people placed their faith in him, he fought their battle. They didn't even have to raise a sword. And they had felt like the Philistines were impossible to conquer. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the story about the woman, the Gentile woman as well, because I think that is applicable here for the Philistines because when they had the ark and they saw the Philistines saw the power of the ark and were receiving all the plagues and such, they recognized that Israel's God had power. Yeah. But unlike that a Gentile woman that came to the Savior, they did not humble themselves and say, oh, what can we do to worship this God and to right. this God? Yeah. yeah like, what they, could have, they could have received the exact same blessings as that Gentile woman did if they would have softened their hearts to, right. to him. I agree 100%. What a great point. Unfortunately, the repentance on the part of the Israelites did not last for very long. They seemed to be quite a superstitious people, and they were constantly anxious and worried about the people around them and being conquered, their lands being taken by the people around them. If you remember, this is always a hard thing for us to think about in our day to day, but the Lord had told them, you're going to have to get rid of everyone in the land. And specifically, the reason you're going to have to get rid of everyone is because of the idol worship, that the hearts have become so hard. And Moses warned the people in Deuteronomy 7 through the Lord that if they did not get rid of the people in the land, their sons and daughters were going to intermarry with those inhabitants and their sons and daughters would end up being involved in the false worship as well. And in fact, this happened from the very beginning and it still was um, true even as we talked about earlier through the destruction of Jerusalem at the end. And so for this short time, they had repented, but they start falling back into their apostate ways and they're losing their battles again to the Philistines. And so the people, again, rather than turning their hearts to God, even though they'd had this one miraculous experience with the thunder defeating the, the Philistines, they decide what we really need is we really need to have a king, just like all the other nations. So first they try taking the ark with them without authority, without the, the priesthood to do and to trying to force God's hand without submitting their will. Then they have this great experience of repenting, but now they're like, okay, we're losing again. So here's another great idea. Let's make a king. So we're just like all the other nations. In fact, it's even written in the scriptures. What I find interesting about that is so that we can be just like everyone else is just as true of motivation today that leads us astray as it was back then thousands of years ago. And what are your thoughts about that, Sam? They're still not getting this whole peculiar people thing or they forget it. It's so sad because the thing that God is trying to give them is the ability to be above it, to be about to pray. This is the beginning of this path where we end up in Daniel 2 eventually. And we talk about how God's going to replace the, the idea of kings with the, the, the current governments that we now enjoy. And President Oaks has a fantastic talk about this when he talks about how the the kingdom of god rolled forth and now we have this uh, we now have a world full of constitutions and presidents and rulers that are subject to the voice of the people but for the israelites to think that they can put their power in a king or they can put their faith in a king again it's just this misdirected application of trust and faith it's this this idea of okay maybe we won't put it in an object but we're going to put it in this charismatic person and it is they're always abdicating their own individual responsibility Right, Because the Lord had told them with the covenant at Mount Sinai that everyone was meant to become a king and a priest and a queen and a priestess unto the Lord. Yeah. In other words, not a king like they're going to make Saul, but king, small king, little K, under the king of kings, Jesus Christ, where one would go before the Lord and ask the Lord's will, then carry out the Lord's will as had been directed. Yeah. And so what's really sad here is that they are, they're saying, not only are we not interested in that promise for ourselves, but they're now creating a counterfeit in setting up this sort of king that they're going to do. That's going to make it so that they completely lose sight of the promise the Lord gave them about all of them becoming kings and queens and priests and priestesses, but not in the way that the world has a king and a queen and a priest and a priestess. 
Absolutely. You're to, as you said, a peculiar people, a unique people, a set apart people. But no, we want to be like everybody else. I think there's a bit, it's easier sometimes for our brains to see the examples of this. It's so easy for us to set people up as our salvation. Yeah. People do it with, I worked for a senator and then for two different U.S. presidents. And there's not, by the way, interesting anecdote that, or, or uh, corollary on this. There's nothing more dep- depressing than a retired senator. <laughs> <laughs> A retired president. We won't ask you to name names. <laughs> <laughs> but just seeing that they're used to their entourages and their people and, and their friends and all these all this praise of the world. Because there there is power. There's some power in this idea of us putting our faith in something. It's just misdirected power unless it's faith in Jesus Christ. It doesn't bring the true uh, divine connection that we're entitled to receive because we got faith in him. But it's very natural for us to do this with celebrities, with, I don't know if anybody's watching the Johnny Depp trial thing it keeps showing up in all of my new stuff I'm like who cares I do speeds too I know it's just ah like who cares but there's so many there's so it's so natural for us to want to worship it's so natural for us to want to to uh, apply ourselves in in love and connection to something that we perceive as superior to us and that's why Satan's very good at saying okay don't know God, but maybe know this good looking person over here or attach your emotion and, and cling to or cleave to or follow this particular a celebrity or individual. And it can be so destructive because it, it totally, it, it's very similar to us selling our souls for a mess of porridge, like what happened with Isaac and, and Esau, right? Like it's not who we're meant to be. Christ is the one who defines us. Christ is the, he is the bridegroom. Like you talk about in your awesome books, which I have a copy of. Right here, <laughs> the redemption of the bride. I mean, it's wonder, it's wonderful because there's just if you can understand, he's the one that defines us. If you're gonna understand, he's the one that we're we're meant to be invited back to. None of that other stuff matters. None of none of our experiences are are debilitating like they threaten to be. And going back to your comment about celebrities and how they look, yeah. All Saul was chosen by the people because. He was handsome and taller than anybody else. Yep. And the sad thing is that Saul at the very beginning does feel humble about this. And he asked Samuel, why me? And in fact, he has an experience where he goes amongst the school of the prophets and Saul himself is filled with the spirit of the Lord. It says in the scripture that the Lord gave Saul a new heart and Saul himself began to prophesy. And so remember, he should have been a type of what a king and a priest could be. Mm. Let's go back to Melchizedek way before. Mm. So Melchizedek, as far as we know, as far as it's written in the scriptures for us, is the first example of a king and priest or prophet um, unto his people in that he held that dual role. And that's what the Lord wants for each of us is to have that dual role at least for our families, beginning for our families. And then we will have that role as well on the, on the other side, the, the post-mortal life. And, but so we have Melchizedek. And then in the Book of Mormon, we have Mosiah and Benjamin, <laughs> Mosiah. And we also have Nephi, King Nephi, who tells us in the beginning chapters of First Nephi, I'm going to tell you how I became a king and a prophet unto my people. And explains what he has to go through to, to do that. So again, these are types of what the Lord wants us to be. And thankfully, the people that lived under those kings had that veil removed so that they could come to understand what their own individual circumstance was meant to be. And later, when uh, the temple is built and we have kings and priests who are anointed and clothed and given names, in front of the pillars of the temple, anyone who was watching that could come to understand, this is what the Lord intends for me. So this was the entire reason that the Lord would have behind choosing a king and a priest, to set this example, because our great king of kings and great high priest is Jesus Christ, and we're trying to become like him. So, so Saul begins, he begins his ministry with this humble heart, a new heart, but things go off the rails pretty quickly. Now it's interesting that Samuel prayed. He really mourned about the fact that the people were choosing a king and he asked the Lord, what should I do? What should I do? And the Lord give the people their way. They have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me that I should not reign over them, which just shows the difference. We'll see a huge difference when David 
becomes king and how the Lord looks upon David becoming king, because David is always going to seek the will of the Lord as he rules his people. We'll talk about, you and I have the opportunity of talking about David for the next couple of weeks. But here, starting with Saul, we're just starting in the wrong direction. We're taking a good principle in terms of king and priest and going in the wrong direction with Saul. Now, Saul never achieves the priesthood, which is an important part of his story. David, by the way, does. And in fact, Joseph Smith tells us that David held the Melchizedek priesthood as did his son Solomon, and that David had a vision where he saw the Lord and the Lord showed him how to build the temple. We'll talk again more about that. And Solomon actually dedicated the temple. This is important for us to understand as we contrast what happens with Saul when Saul tries to take on some priesthood duties. So let's go ahead and talk about that. The Lord had told, or excuse me, uh, Samuel had told Saul, I'm going to meet you in Gilgal after the next battle. And, and he told Saul, he said, wait for me. I'm going to be about seven days. So they have a battle against the Philistines. And um, Saul has waited for seven days. This is a couple of years into his rule as the king. And the people start deserting the army. They're just waiting around. They don't know what to do with themselves. And they start going home. And so Saul becomes impatient as he's been waiting. And he, he takes the best of the, the flock that of the people they had conquered. And he also takes the king captive who the Lord had told him to kill. Mm -hmm. And, and he takes him into Gilgal and then Saul himself, again, without the priesthood, he offers the offerings of the flocks. And it's interesting because it says, as soon as he finished, as soon as he finished, Samuel showed up. Showed up. <laughs> yeah. What did Samuel, what did Samuel do? He just reminded me, the, why did you do this? The Lord delights in obedience more than bird offerings which is a, a beautiful reminder of what all of this is designed to get us to follow and come closer to Christ. What's, what's interesting, and, and back to your point about what changed his name, but the records that we have suggest that Melchizedek was the was Shem, yeah, Noah's son. And Malki Zadok, or different pronunciations of that means my king righteousness. Melchizedek was so focused on pointing other people to Christ, he literally changed his name to say, look at Christ, don't look at me. He, he, Melchizedek was a window to the beauty and majesty of Jesus Christ and didn't try and stand in the way of that. Didn't try and set himself up as a false God or something to be worshiped. But Saul here, it's all about Saul. He's trying to reconcile some pain or some insecurity or, or take some prestige or do something to be able to prove how important and valuable he is by going and doing these sacrifices. And he misses the point. He thinks that the sacrifices are what bring holiness. The sacrifices are what bring power and authority. And he's, by doing so, he set himself up as a false prophet and prevented the people from understanding how to come closer to Jesus Christ, which is why Samuel shows up and says, the Lord loves obedience more than sacrifice. It's all about us coming closer to him. It's such a sad story. <laughs> it's so sad, but I think we all do it. I think we've all done this at times where we miss the mark and try and do something that we think is right when we're really missing the point of coming closer to Christ. Yeah, I'm so glad that you shared that. In fact, Samuel tells Saul that he is now going to lose the kingdom. Mm -hmm. it, it's done. It's not, okay, you get another chance. It's done. So a couple of things there to me is that the sense that to those people to whom God calls and holds, he holds us greatly accountable when we're called to leaders of, are called to positions of leadership. He holds us highly accountable. And so the question is that today, we have that invitation of becoming kings and priests and queens and priestesses unto God when we take upon ourselves the temple covenants that were anointed to become that in the kingdom of God. We also have the opportunity where we're called into positions of leadership, where, as you've pointed out, the whole purpose of, of those great leaders who went before us, Melchizedek, Nephi, <clears throat> King Benjamin, is to bring others to Christ. So do you think that there are times that we're tempted like Saul to uh, rest authority that we don't have? In other words, Saul did have authority to be king, but he did not have authority to offer the offerings. He did not have priesthood authority. Do you feel like even with priesthood authority today that sometimes we're tempted to rest the will of the Lord, to bring people to ourselves? What are your thoughts about that? Absolutely. I think we do at times. Anytime we're trying to set ourselves 
up as something that that is higher or only or even proves to other people that we're close to God. Anytime we're trying to set up a false sense of import or, uh, you know, the, the, the Doctrine and Covenants talks about the scenario where someone loses that priesthood authority, like the amen to the priest of that man, whenever we exercise unrighteous dominion, this idea of unrighteous dominion, righteousness being another name of Christ, it means we're doing something without his authority. And there's lots of examples of this. And it's a difficult thing because we're in all reality, Linda, I think we we're all, we all have experiences with where we don't have authority <laughs> or we don't have sufficient faith or then but together. And because this earth life is designed to help us understand how we fail and then understand how Christ fills the gap and helps us uh, gain his presence and, and learn. But the, I've heard examples of people who have given, men who have given priesthood blessings and commanded someone to be healed and they're not healed. I've heard experiences of scenario, stories where someone will give a blessing and the person receiving the blessing won't even hear the blessing, but there's a barrier there as almost as if to shield the, the recipient of the blessing from the person that's giving the blessing because the person is trying they're, they're in, uh, the, uh, a portion of their intent is, is pure. They're trying to help someone, but anytime we exercise any form of unrighteous dominion, anytime we exercise any, any form of compulsion, male or female, we grieve the heavens. We, we make the angels around us have to turn away or, or we draw ourselves away from the power and influence of the Holy Ghost. And it's natural for us to have those experiences. It's natural for us to be in a position where we sense that we didn't do it what, the way we we're supposed to. And then the choice comes, do I humble myself and recognize that the power is not in me, that the power is in Jesus Christ, or do I get puffed up in my pride and try and cover my sins? and try and pretend like I'm connected when I'm not. And, and that's a difficult choice that uh, we get to make moment by moment, uh, almost every day. I think, are we going to be humble and grateful and receive from God? Like David did when he first was called, are we going to tr trust in this idea that, he, that Christ is the one that's leading us, that he's going to fill the gap and that he's going to be the reason and all of our actions point others to him, or are we going to try and sell ourselves up as a false sense of deity to be right. worshiped or or loved or whatever. So two thoughts that came to me with this story is I was thinking about the 2000 sons of Helaman mm. and that they experienced miraculous salvation. And it tells us because first of all, they believed the scriptures as had been taught to them. They fasted by, by their mothers. I'm, yeah. It's such sure. a valuable insight. Yeah. yeah. They fasted and prayed and it says they did everything they obeyed with exactness. And so I think that's an important lesson that we can take from Saul as well. Samuel said, wait seven days. And Saul had waited seven days, but Samuel was the one to offer the offerings. And Saul was supposed to have performed even the, the destruction of the people and the animals with exactness. And when we don't do it with exactness, then these kinds of consequences follow. The other thing that I was thinking about in terms of the story is the recognition of authority, because how important it was for Saul to recognize that Samuel was the prophet and that Samuel had that authority, if you will, over him in that respect. And, um, and, and Saul had put himself on an equal plane with Samuel. And I was thinking that today, um, because we have lots of questions about who has authority and aren't I equal with them? And, Interestingly enough, we have an interesting story in the book of Numbers that was not included in our Come Follow Me manual, where Kohath, who is a Levite, leads a number of other Levites against Moses and Aaron because Kohath and his friends want to minister in the temple, in the holy place. They were allowed to minister in the outer parts of the temple, but only the direct descendants of Aaron could minister within the within the tabernacle uh, itself, within the holy place, and the holy of holies was only the high priest. Kohath, literally the words he used are words we hear today all the time. He said, aren't we all good? Aren't we all as good as you are? And aren't we all equal to the Lord taught them a very harsh lesson about that he will call whom he will call for that authority. And so I think that today we might be in the same danger because uh, it seems that people are questioning who has authority to tell them what to do, 
who has authority to speak in the name of the Lord. And almost like Kohath saying, aren't I equal to all of you? And so what I'm noticing is that on my end of things, I'm seeing people ask less and less for priesthood counsel, priesthood blessings, and specifically for patriarchal blessings. Any thoughts about that? You know, it, it is a really interesting point. Um, I have a lot of, lots of thoughts. I think it's interesting that it's all about our hearts. It always comes back to our hearts. Are our hearts soft and receptive? And if we're willing to receive counsel from the Lord, then he will use his methods that he's foreordained from before the earth to help us receive his truth and his light and his love and help us become who we're meant to become. I had a conversation with a, a young sister who I taught in seminary and she ended up getting into leaving high school and getting into college. Every time I'd see her at church, I would say, have you gotten your patriarchal blessing yet? And she finally came to me. I hadn't seen her for several months. She came back to me and she said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get my patriarchal blessing. And, I'm, and I feel like I, this is really important for me. So she went and got it and then came back and she was like, I can't believe I waited this long to get this. God's not going to force it on us. The, the power and the purpose and the light and the love in that direct revelation, that scripture is something that can only be enjoyed by someone who's willing to receive it. So God's not going to go push it. It's like trying to force feed a birthday cake. <laughs> so funny, right? There's no way he's going to force it. But it's interesting that it's about the heart. And the, this symbolism of the heart, or not even symbolism, this theme of the heart with David and with Solomon and, and with Saul and how they interact that Saul's heart was new, but then it became corrupted. And that the Lord, when we get to David, he talks about looking at David's heart. I think that there's something about that, that we could take away in our daily lives. And it's this idea that we have the opportunity to listen and to speak what the Lord tells us. And when the Holy ghost prompts our speech, I feel like he's telling me what to say right now. That's when we speak with our lips and with our heart. And that's true creative power. When our lips and our hearts are aligned we're able to speak with the power of the tongue of angels. We're able to speak with the power of the Holy Ghost that, that carries the cogency and the force and the power to change other hearts and minds. When we disconnect our lips from our hearts and we say things or do things that are inconsistent with what our hearts known to be true, it's destructive and ruin. It's defilement. It's, and it's one of the reasons why I think the Lord, it's hard for us to understand why the Lord would command Saul to just way laced to everything. But there's something we don't understand there. I'm sure that if, if people live consistently disconnection between their hearts and their lips, if they live in that, it, it's really just living a lie, then it start it literally starts to change everything around you. Just like God changes everything around him, the darkness of lives changes the very matter around the people that are living there. You can walk into somebody's home who has been doing things evil in their life and you could feel that darkness and you don't want to be in the home. It maybe even feels haunted. I don't know if we've talked about this before, but did you know in something like 34 states, it's legally required to disclose if a house is haunted or if a crime has been committed <laughs> in the house before you sell it. There, We all sense that sin, or in my opinion, sin is living inconsistent with who we really are. And it's really poignant and painful when we say things, but we don't mean what we say. When we deceive, it's the fruit of the, uh, the deceiver and it, and it creates a darkness and, and a, a decay that the Lord is trying to purge so that the Israelites can be who they're meant to become. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Also, I think it's important in terms of everything you just shared is that the Lord cares so much about the rising generation. Yes. yes. And, and when the youth or the children don't stand a chance because of the darkness that's prevailing in their society, that's when we see the Lord say, it's time to clean things up. In fact, in the Doctrine and Covenants, the Lord says that when he cleanses the earth again, he's going to start with his own people, the people that call themselves by his name. So very much to your point about, are we speaking one thing, but our hearts are in a, are in a different place. And the Lord is really aware of that. And in fact, in the Bible dictionary, it tells us the purpose of prayer, the real purpose of prayer is to align our will with yeah. the will of the Lord, with the will of the Lord. That's all about a change of heart. That's all about a change of heart. And we see that in Saul at the beginning. And we see then when his heart becomes set on himself and on his own power, where things go off the rails. And then we'll see it again with David. And David has one great failing, and we'll talk about that next week. 
But other than than that, even in the midst of that failing, God calls David a man after his own heart because David openly admits his sin and his failing and repents before all the people of Israel, submitting himself to, to God. He doesn't try to hide hide what he has done. He doesn't try to hide his responsibility. He does have a very stiff consequence from the Lord, but his heart is set on the Lord. And we'll see that as we continue our study of David. But it's beautiful, this emphasis on the heart, because God's heart was set on David and David's heart was set on the Lord. And when Samuel is told, Saul, the Lord is going to take the kingdom away from Saul. Um, Samuel, I want you to go and anoint the next king. He's going to be one of the sons of Jesse. Mm -hmm. Um, It's interesting because David is out in the field. He's a kid. He's taking care of the sheep. He has six older brothers. Or does he have seven older brothers? Remind me. Is it seven older brothers? Now I can't remember either. (laughs) I think it is. He has seven older brothers that Samuel goes through first. And Samuel's impressed with many of them and asks the Lord with each. Is it? It's got to be this one, right? It's got to be this one. Mm -hmm. And the Lord tells him. No, the Lord says, uh, look not on his countenance, which is what the people had done with Saul looking on his face or the height of his stature, which is how they'd chosen Saul, because I've refused him for the Lord seeth not as a man seeth for the man, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the, and this is how David was chosen. And again, this sense that I love it of uh, David is a man after my own heart. Now, We'll talk next week, too, about how important this is for fulfilling prophecy, because the patriarchal blessing, back to patriarchal blessings, given to Judah was that kings were going to come from his loins and that eventually the Messiah would come from his loins. Saul was from the tribe of Benjamin and David is from the tribe of Judah in fulfillment of that prophecy. And in fact, David becomes a type and shadow of Jesus Christ, whom people called the son of David. So let's start with the beautiful story of David and Goliath, where again, he's still just a kid and he's bringing provisions to his brothers who are at war with the Philistines. This is long ongoing battles with the Philistines. And the Philistines have appointed a champion to fight in their behalf. And this means that if Israel will appoint a champion and there's a battle between the two champions, whoever wins, that team's the winner. And their champion is Goliath, a giant who were told is more than seven feet tall. David is a kid and um, he's so small that he can't even wear the armor of Saul. He's drowned in it. But what is David's motivation? He hears Goliath mocking the God of Israel. And Goliath is, where are your gods, you puny people, basically. And David is offended for that. He's offended for God. And he says to his brothers, how can you let this man speak about God like this? And his brothers, the brothers, basically, you little kid, go back home. You don't know what you're doing and you have no idea what you're talking about. But David feels really strongly that somebody has got to defend the name of God. And David trusts in God so much that he believes that if no one else will step forward, he will step forward just wearing his regular shepherd gear clothing and taking a sling and stone for his weapons. And in fact, he says to Goliath, thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord sweareth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. So again, he just sees himself as the defender of God, the defender of God's name. And he is so at one with God that he has no fear. He has no fear. It's incredible, isn't it? And it's also the perfect mixture of this idea of faith and authority that we've been talking about because he is identified by the Lord as someone who can perform in, on his, in his name, but he also has the power of the faith. And he's had these amazing experiences beforehand where he saves his flock from wild beasts, from lions and, and bears and things that, that come to try and attack. And he uses the sling and his faith in the Lord to, to defend the flock, which is a beautiful symbol of Christ as the shepherd, just as David is the shepherd. But there's also this idea that David is, he's, it's like true, powerful, righteous, almost indignation. <laughs> like. I, I was just telling my seminary kids this morning that 
all emotions are gifts from God. All of these different emotions that we feel, it's just the, the critical element, the thing that divides us from animals and from the natural man and helps us become more like God is what we choose to do with those emotions. And David takes this righteous indignation here and his faith in Christ. And he says, I'm going to, I'm going to prove not only to the Philistines, but, to, uh, but especially to all of Israel. Yeah. That God isn't about swords. He isn't about shields. He's about faith in Christ and he will defend his people. And it's just, it's such a powerful story that I don't know if you've read Malcolm Gladwell's book on this, where he talks about David and Goliath and he breaks down this, he comes at it from a statistician or kind of a more of a mathematical perspective. And he talks about how, well, David didn't know this, but Goliath was a giant. And so he probably was slow and probably his heart probably had defects and he probably had all, Goliath had all these uh, physical ailments associated with him because maybe he had giganticism or whatever it is. But I, I think it's important to remember that really what's happening here is David doesn't have to know anything other than Christ is the King, Christ is the Lord, Christ will perform a miracle. And let's look at a few things about it too. So first of all, David had been anointed by Samuel at this point. Mm -hmm. And look how humble he is. He's not telling anybody. He's yeah. not telling anyone. He's not going because I'm going to be the next King. His whole motivation is how can I serve God? How can I defend the name of God? And he's not bragging to his brothers, not to anyone else. And in fact, we'll see as we talk next week that David waits for the Lord. As a, Let's compare. Saul could not wait to offer the sacrifice, uh, to have Samuel offer the sacrifice. But David, even though he is now anointed king, will wait for many years for God to say, now's the time for you to be a king. And before he does, every single step, David asks the Lord, shall I go up to battle? Shall I go to Judah? Shall I accept this offering from these people? And so totally different experience here between Saul and David. Also the sense of the, the Israelites who had earlier in battle against the Philistines looked to the ark to save them. And here is David completely, entirely relying solely on the Lord, believing with all of his heart the Lord is going to defeat Goliath in order to stop Goliath speaking against the Lord as, as he is. So it's a really powerful to me testimony to us about the way some of the characteristics of David that could help us in terms of being someone who is after the Lord's own heart as the Lord described David. What are some of the other things that stand out to you? Well, there's just this idea of the whole purpose of the church is, is to help people become sanctified and then exalted, right? This idea of us sanctifying ourselves in a way that allows the Lord to do things through us and with us. And as we've been talking about this, Linda, I'm just connecting these dots in my head that I think there, there's something beautiful and powerful about how David's experience, it shows us that the Lord, he's trying to point us to, to Christ. He's trying to, he's trying to help us understand who he is and how we can have a relationship with him. And as we do that, he will sanctify everything around us. He'll bless everything around us for our good. And David's humility is like this, this beautiful, powerful, humble gratitude mixture, right? Like it is his real power is his willingness to just receive whatever God wants him to receive. And, he, and he'll wait as long as he has to wait. It's such a, it's such a powerful example. It's such a beautiful example. It reminded me a lot of what you've taught about Zion in your book and in former podcasts is that the Lord will show us who we are, that we can receive a complete restoration through mm -hmm. Christ. And David had that kind of experience with Christ. And again, it was line upon line, precept upon precept. Huh. David doesn't know everything at the very beginning. In fact, he seems to be puzzled when he's anointed as king. And as we've said, he doesn't start acting like the king. He no. lets the Lord reveal to him in his own time who he is as David and who he's meant to be. So that David always has his will aligned, except for the one great sin with Bathsheba and Uriah. He has his will aligned with the Lord in performing as the Lord would have him perform. So that as Joseph Smith teaches, at some point, David becomes a priest. We don't have the record of that, but when he's dancing before the ark, and we'll talk about that next week, he's in priestly robes and he has the Melchizedek priesthood, according to Joseph Smith, because he has seen God. So again, he waits for that personal encounter with Christ, but he has prepared himself so that he's ready for it as well. So yes. what are some ways that we can also ourselves 
wait on the Lord, submit our will to the Lord and allow him to reveal to us what his missions are for us. What a great question. I, and I have an idea on this and I hope you tell me what you've thought about this because I know you've been thinking about this a lot. I, I, for me, it's, there are these experiences, we've talked about this before, but we're just, life is just a, a, a bunch of moments stacked onto each other. These, I think Elder Uchter said, or maybe Elder Iring said, eternity is made up of the molecules of today or something to that effect. So that we have all these experiences and these experiences threaten to define us or keep us away from God. They affect our heart. If we're able to take these experiences, every experience, and look at it as a gift and take it to the Lord and say, what do you want me to learn from this? How do you want me to understand this? How, how can I find you in this moment? Whether it's descending into the ache of old age, or it's dealing with the heartache of some trial that we have to go through with a, with a child or a sibling or a, a work situation or, or whatever pain or fear we have to experience in this life. When we have those experiences, if we could surrender them to him and uh, trust that, that those Goliaths in our lives or those uh, difficult, painful losses, like we, you know, losing the tabernacle or dealing with a loss of, because of sin, like with Saul, where he made this mistake. If instead of choosing to have that define us as a way that we can't come back to God and instead humble ourselves and go to the Lord and say, what am I supposed to learn? How do you want me to, uh, how do you want me to change? How do you want me to grow? How, do, how can I show to you that you're the most important thing to me? If we do that, I believe that's what the Lord means when he says David was after his own heart. Because the Lord talks about how that which we take into our heart is our treasure. Wh whatever we place our heart on is our treasure. So if the number one thing that we desire with our heart, the number one thing we're focused on, the number one thing we look to is Christ, then none of these experiences will prevent us from returning to him. In fact, they'll enrich us. They'll benefit us and lift us and he can incorporate them as, as strengths into our character and our personality. They'll refine us. But if we instead think that these titles and positions or popularity or good experiences, these good days or these good moments that we think mean that we're good enough or valuable or that somehow we can be, finally be happy because we have this or we have that. If we do that, then we're, we're stuck in that cycle that the Lord was trying to purge from the Israelites. And it's a hard labor. It's a hard labor to be in a place where you're willing to, like you said earlier, go to the Lord and have these conversations with him. And I, I believe it's the most important purpose of this life is to be able to, to find him in those experiences. Yes. Beautiful. Thank you. Beautifully put. David wrote many of the Psalms mm. that we have. And many of the Psalms that David wrote were used in temple worship. Yes. Are powerful and beautiful. God and God's temple were at the center of David's heart. And I think that we could do well to keep those at the center of our heart as well. So I wanted to close as we talked about Israelites putting trust in a symbol in the ark, Saul putting trust in himself, David putting trust in God. Mm. And I'm just going to close with this from Psalm 56, 11. In God have I put my trust. I will not be afraid what man can do to me. I love it. Yeah, That's absolutely. It. And what a beautiful comparison. That's such beautiful contrast. Thank you. Let David have the last word there. Thank you for thank you for joining with me, Sam. We're going to be talking about David next week, David and Solomon. Then we're going to be talking about Elijah. And we have quite a few things coming up. So this is fun and exciting. We want to remind everybody to please and subscribe. And thank you so much for joining with us. Drawing from the ancient scriptural records, modern revelation, and a wealth of personal experience, author Samuel D. Castor strives to prepare the righteous of the world for the coming times. Zion Rising by Samuel D. Castor. He will help you discover the history of Zion's first rise with Enoch, signs of the second coming in modern day events, and ways you can prepare yourself and your family to uphold the ideals of Zion. Find it at cedarfort.com. Use code PODCAST20 for 20% off your entire order. The beautiful allegory of the redemption of the bride tells the story of the house of Israel, her covenant betrothal to Jehovah, her adulterous apostasy from that covenant, and her restoration through his tender mercies and compassion upon her. The story of Jehovah and his bride is a promise of hope to every individual who fears that they may have strayed too far from the Lord. Although, like the bride, we may have traveled a dark road, 
His atoning grace and mercy can heal and restore us to a newness of purity and hope. This is God's love story, beautifully detailed by Linda Cherry. It is also our story, each one of us. We are the bride of Christ, and he is waiting for us. Find it at cedarfort.com. Use code PODCAST20 for 20% off your entire order.